Okay, the very last two uh, topics we want to discuss in uh, this lecture uh, are the ideas of social mobility and poverty. We'll take each of these in turn. Um, as we talked about when we defined what a class society was, is that a class society allows for movement between the classes. So even, again, back to our basic uh, triangle depiction here, we'll say upper, middle, and lower classes, we could say that in a class society, movement between these classes is possible, and not only possible to a large degree, it's a goal of many people in society. Clearly the goal is generally to move in an upward direction, so we move from lower class to middle class and middle class to upper class, uh, and then we'll talk about uh, movement downward in just a second. So if we assume then that society or within a class society people can move from, uh, from class to class, we call that again social mobility, sometimes also referred to as the class ladder. Uh, there are a couple different ways that this can happen and does happen. Uh, one is intergenerational, which I'm going to take a look at uh, social mobility, we can take a look at uh, mobility that occurs between uh, generations. So uh, again, sometimes we use the idealized term, the American dream, uh, where we, we generally talk about people moving upward in society, uh, but more specifically we sometimes uh, refer to the idea that um, in our society that children, quote unquote, should be better off than their parents who came before them. So in other words, uh, you know, if your parents were lower class and they worked very hard and, and did everything they possibly could to send their children to school and then their, their children uh, got a better education uh, than their parents were able to earn, the assumption is that that translates into better jobs and again, upward mobility. So. Um, this is often sometimes used as a, as a kind of a, uh, an important benchmark when we look at uh, society overall and we look at intergenerational social mobility and determine whether or not that's happening. So when we generally say that a society is doing very well or uh, uh, social mobility is positive, it's because as a, as a whole we generally see as generations go on that the generations of the people who came before are doing better off. If we look at society and we say, that the children of parents who have been in the country for more than one generation are doing not as well as their parents, then sometimes, again, that's a, that's a, a pretty big concern uh, for policymakers. Why don't people seem to be succeeding in our society along generational lines? Uh, we can take a look at structural social mobility. This is the idea that sometimes uh, society changes in dramatic ways and creates uh, structural changes or changes in the social structure and that sometimes then that will affect people's social mobility both upwards and downwards um, uh, you know at a time in society when uh, factory work was perhaps kind of on the decline but at the time also that uh, American society uh, was becoming more of an informational society and the advent of computers and word processing uh, automated a lot more of that type of work, you could say that for a lot of factory workers whose jobs were perhaps being outsourced or eliminated, their social mobility was in a downward position, but for those people who were trained in working on computers, their social mobility would then be upward. And that is not due necessarily just to the behavior of individuals, but the fact that the entire structure of society changes allowing for it. Uh, in today's uh, energy production. We can say, and sometimes the big debate is uh, about the jobs of coal miners, and we can say, well, clearly uh, as America uh, in some ways it seems to be moving away from more combustible materials and uh, 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 things like coal, that again, those jobs in that industry would be experiencing downward social mobility, but if we are doing more reliance on renewable energies, wind and solar, and people are being trained in those types of, of energy uh, production fields, that that, again, mobility will be upward. Okay? So uh, changes in the structure of society can produce social mobility. And then the concept of exchange mobility is uh, kind of a, a, a discussion of the overall equilibrium of even just, like I said, this very simple model, upper, middle, lower. Uh, could we have a situation where uh, 
so many people moved up from lower classes that uh, the middle class would become in some ways bigger than the lower class. So let's just uh, kind of, you know, using a, uh, a cheap example here, a simple example, uh, we can change the dimensions of this uh, thing and say, is it likely that we'd ever be in a position where the middle class would outnumber the lower classes? Okay. Probably not likely. Okay. Or, or what the middle class would wonder about, could there be so many people at the top of society, the upper classes would outnumber the middle and lower classes? Once again, that seems unlikely. And we ask ourselves, well then, what keeps this pyramid kind of in an equilibrium, and it's that idea of exchange mobility. Uh, kind of the old, the old saying is, what goes up must come down. Uh, to find in this sense what we'd be saying is, for every person that moves upwards in society, uh, there probably is likely someone or people of equal number moving downward in society. So that overall, we'd probably not have a situation such as we talked about here, where we have these large changes uh, in uh, this equilibrium, and that it is much more likely that the old traditional upper, middle, lower model would sustain itself. Okay? We'll discuss this again just a bit, this exchange mobility, when we talk about uh, the issue of poverty. So when we talk about what is poverty in a society, well, by definition, uh, according to the Weberian model that we just discussed, the working poor and underclass are about 20% of the U.S. population. Okay? So about one in every five person could be considered uh, living at or near uh, uh, an idea of poverty in our society. And once again, there are two types of poverty, what we call absolute poverty and relative poverty. Uh, absolute poverty is the idea that uh, individuals have no access to that which is necessary to live. So when we talk about food, shelter, uh, medical attention, and being deprived of those things is considered absolute poverty. When we talk about relative poverty, we talk about uh, people in a society that don't have access to uh, the material goods or uh, things that at least are accessible by the majority of people in society. So, um, again, sometimes it's useful when we do cross-cultural definitions of poverty. Uh, clearly, when we look at people around the world who are starving to death or, or uh, you know, uh, subject to disease uh, that, that can't be treated or controlled or have no access to uh, clean drinking water and those people are dying from those things, we call that absolute poverty. Uh, when we look across societies, we could say that many people who live in the United States who we would consider to be in poverty are not as bad off, let's say, as people who live in poverty in a third world country, but they live in poverty, in relative poverty in our society because they don't have access to all the things that we would consider to be kind of normal in uh, an industrialized society such as ours. So we can make that distinction. Uh, the difference between relative and absolute poverty. And that's not to say, though, that there aren't people who are suffering poverty to a degree even in an industrialized country like the United States that wouldn't be considered absolute poverty. So, in other words, people who have absolutely no access to uh, food, shelter, uh, or, or uh, medical care. So, when we talk about this idea of poverty, it's important to recognize when we say who is or is not in or at the level of poverty, that there is something called the poverty line. And sometimes we talk about that and think about it as maybe just some kind of abstract idea, but it is in fact an actual uh, designation uh, that can be arrived at through calculation that determines according to society and, and basically government policies as to who is and who is not considered to be actually living in poverty in our society. And I'm not gonna show you that entire, because uh, you know, as you can imagine, uh, it's a very complicated formula, but I'm going to oversimplify it just to, to illustrate the basic concept. So the idea behind the poverty line is that, uh, uh, again, government policy or government standards will dictate how much a family of a certain size should spend on food in a given time period. So let's just assume uh, for a second that 
um, the, uh, the government standard, let's just say, uh, for a family of four, so a family with four people in it, that the standard would be that that family of four should spend $100 a month on food. Right. And then the next part of the formula is that number that the family of four should spend on food is multiplied by a factor of three, resulting in, again, this oversimplified version, $300 a month. So if a family of four is making $300 or less dollars a month, then that family would be said to be living in poverty. Okay. Uh, again, you can clearly see. So again, that would be 12 times 3, 36. Well, obviously that's uh, much less than what we were talking about. But even again, this is not a, a real uh, number. But so if this family was supposed to be spending $100 a month on food and they're making less than $300, $300 a month, uh, then that family would be considered to be living below the poverty line. Okay, a couple different problems uh, that most people agree, uh, critics of obviously this, this calculation will look at. And if I were to say to you, okay, if you were in fact a family of four only bringing home about $300 a month, would you be in a position to be able to spend $100 of that money you had per month on food? And of course the answer is no, uh, that most families have a lot of expenses beyond food and that a family of four living on $300 a month would be spending the majority of that on rent and daycare and uh, possibly, uh, like I said, medical uh, attention and transportation, trying to afford a car or public transportation, whatever else it is. And that that idea of spending a third of your money on food uh, for most families, even those of high income, is, is fairly ridiculous. Uh, that, that families are not in a position to do that. So when we then say, okay, what perhaps should this number be if it's not going to be three, uh, most people would probably say, well, the number or the factor should be at least five, which would result in this number, of course, being different. And this number would now be, so the government is still saying that uh, the amount spent should be $100 a month and we operate on a factor of five, that would mean any family making less than $500 a month would be considered under poverty, but it would be much more realistic that if a family was uh, only making $500 a month that they would probably be spending 400 on things other than food and then $100 on food. Well, why hasn't that ratio or that formula then been changed? Once again, I said these are government policies. So you can, again, I'm going to oversimplify here, but you can imagine that very few politicians want to take the stance of saying that they want to increase the formula or increase the ratio of the formula that's going to then, by definition, put more people in society under the poverty line. Okay, because again, the poverty line is also used as a definition to a large degree for who uh, qualifies for things like uh, food stamps or uh, subsidized housing or uh, other government uh, programs or benefits, um, you know, uh, Medicaid, Medicare, those kind of things. So a politician saying, uh, you know, under my administration, I am going to triple or you know, double the number of people who, in our society who live in poverty is a pretty unlikely thing to hear. Um, also, the poverty line, to a large degree, doesn't recognize a lot of broad sweeping changes uh, in society as far as our economy goes. Uh, and again, it's also in some ways considered a national standard where it doesn't recognize uh, that certainly rates of poverty and the conditions of poverty uh, sometimes change from uh, place to place to place in the United States. Um, so in general, again, if we're back to this idea of talking about poverty in the United States, uh, and again, this sometimes illustrates uh, how important it is to uh, rely on factual information rather than what we sometimes think of as common sense uh, when we think about poverty in the country.
Um, uh, again, in the text, there's a, a quiz in this chapter that kind of you know, challenges people's stereotypes, but also uh, presents a lot of just general information about who and who is not uh, uh, some of the predictors of poverty in our society. Um, when we think of geography, uh, the majority of people uh, living in poverty in the United States live in the rural south. So sometimes when we think of poverty, we automatically think of inner cities and we think of uh, perhaps cities like Detroit. It's not, not to say that there isn't poverty in those areas. When we look at the overall uh, nation, uh, the majority of people who live in poverty live in the rural south. Um, when I usually ask the question about uh, race or ethnicity, uh, most people, again, sometimes we jump to uh, the conclusion that the majority of people in poverty in our country uh, are, are minority groups. Um, most poor people or most people who live in poverty in the United States are white. Uh, and again, the largest factor is that this time in our society, the majority of the population is white. Um, the highest rates of poverty are definitely among minority groups, uh, Latinos, African Americans, and Native Americans. Uh, clearly being the, the groups, the ethnic groups within our society that have the highest rates of poverty among their populations. Um, in regard to education, uh, approximately uh, anybody in our society who uh, has a college degree uh, only basically has a 3% chance or it's a mix of about 3% of the people uh, who live in poverty. So obviously for any college students, uh, that is a good indicator. Um, and the flip side of that coin is high school dropouts are, uh, make up about 25% of the total uh, population in this country of people who live in poverty. Um, family structure, once again, some of the other factors we talked about. Uh, a mother-father uh, configuration family is the least likely type to be living in poverty, whereas single parent uh, dominates uh, the majority of, of types of families living in society. And above those, uh, clearly single mother families, which sometimes refers to, uh, sometimes uh, has us refer to uh, what we sometimes call the feminization of poverty. Uh, we realize that the single mother household is the type most likely to be in poverty. Um, uh, out of the three following groups, uh, children, adults, and the elderly, uh, sometimes uh, ask who is the most likely to live in poverty. Uh, and again, a, a lot of perceptions of the elderly uh, live in poverty. And that is likely to change uh, as, again, more and more and more people in our society uh, become elderly. We'll discuss that in a future module. As well as the idea that um, many of the social programs which exist today may or may not be in existence uh, to support the elderly in the future. Uh, but in today's society, at this time, uh, the largest single group living in poverty among the three age groups that I mentioned are definitely children. Um, so we look at all these things and again we recognize that approximately 20 percent of the population uh, is at or above the poverty line at this time is about 15 percent is actually defined as living at or below the poverty line with approximately 40 percent of that number actually living uh, below half of what the poverty line is. So what we actually we refer to again uh, as, as um, kind of an absolute poverty. So a very large number of people in our society live in and around this defined uh, line uh, that denotes the lowest uh, ends of uh, as far as the class scale goes. Um, some other statistics are, uh, again, uh, we talk about this exchange mobility that for every person that goes up, another person goes down. And if we were to kind of just define this poverty line, one of the things we see is kind of a constant movement across this line, where we see that uh, when families fall below or individuals fall below the poverty line, uh, they're not likely to spend very much time there. It's usually about a year. So we can kind of point to some of the uh, causes for poverty, such as losing a job or uh, uh, family illness or other types of crisis, that usually families will, in a lot of ways, recover from those crises, adapt, and then pull themselves back up above the poverty line. Uh, but then, of course, exchange mobility says that for every family that pulls itself up, another one is likely to moving down. And we definitely see that that number, while we see quite a bit of movement across that poverty line, we generally see that uh, for at least the time being, the numbers of people living in poverty have remained relatively stable.